morning. Welcome to a new day in the family of faith here at West Hills Baptist Church. It is a beautiful day outside, and it is just, it's just, just a beautiful way for us to be connected in this way. I'm, I'm so grateful that, that in the midst of all the craziness of the world that we are still able to come together and worship this way. Will you join me in a moment of prayer? God above us, God before us, God within us. Be now between us a bridge across which your truth can pass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Our New Testament passage this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew. This is in the 18th chapter. The subtitle is True Greatness. And this is one of those passages that we just seem to gloss over so quickly, and it really shouldn't be that way. Um, the disciples come to Jesus and asked some questions he had to be shaking his head and then Jesus gives a warning and it is a warning to all of us we need to take it very seriously it reads this way at that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven you can almost feel the frustration Jesus must have had having been asked this question by them so he uses it as a teachable moment and he says he called a child whom he put among them and said, truly I tell you, and remember any time Jesus uses those words, truly I tell you, something very important follows, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And then Jesus gives a very stern warning Think about what he's saying here about misleading children and what their understanding of God might be. He says, if any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. Occasions, occasions for stumbling are bound to come. But woe to the one by whom the stumbling block comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or lame than to have two hands or two feet and to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into the hell of fire. Now, before I go on, I want to point something very important out about this passage. When you look at the word hell in your Bible, when Jesus uses this word, there's a little footnote there. And when you look to see what that footnote is, the Greek word for the term that Jesus is using here is Gehenna. Gehenna was the place where, on the other side of the wall in Jerusalem, where they burnt their garbage. There was almost always a fire there. They were burning garbage. So when Jesus uses this analogy, the disciples who heard it would have heard it about like throwing your life away, burning like garbage, just throwing your life away like garbage. That's the way we need to hear it. And then he tells the parable of the lost sheep. Take care that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you, in heaven their angels continually see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine who never went astray. So it is with the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost. Have you ever had a friend that just seemed to get away with everything? I would surmise that some of my friends kind of thought that about me growing up. But I have to tell you, the things that we did were, you know, mischievous and, and stupid, but not like felonies. I can't really talk about it anymore because my girls are now teenagers, and I'm not admitting to anything. I guess I'm going to have to get used to answering their questions about my past like this. I think I'm just going to have to say I can neither confirm nor deny what you are asking me about. We had a friend growing up that always took it a step farther than we would ever go. 
He would go do this stuff all the time, but he wouldn't tell us when he was doing it because he knew that we wouldn't have anything to do about it, to do with it. But he still seemed to get away with everything, whatever he did. He just seemed to get away with it. A couple of years after we graduated from high school, this guy comes back from having lived in Atlanta for a while and tells us how he ended up in jail. They were out stealing stereos out of cars. He had a stolen stereo in one hand and got his arm stuck in the door of another car he was trying to break into. The police came, had to help him get his arm out, arrested him, uh, took him to jail, and when he made his bail, they accidentally handed him the stereo that he had stolen and sent him on his way. Some people, it seems, get away with just about everything. At the other end of that extreme are those who seem to pay a price, not only for the things that they do, but seem to be born into situations in which they pay dearly. I'll never forget hearing a story of a preacher friend of mine who was involved in prison ministry. He had been doing it for some time, and then one day they informed him that they were going to allow him to meet with the most dangerous man in the prison. They instructed him to make sure that he did not come within arm's distance of this man. They wanted to make sure that this man couldn't reach him. And they said, you can talk to him, you can say anything that you want, but the guards will be present there with you, and they're going to make sure that you're safe. So he spoke to this man. They had a good exchange. And as he was leaving, he asked this man if he could pray for him. And the man said yes. And before the guards could do anything about it, my friend laid his hand on this man's shoulder and began to pray. And at the end of the prayer, this hardened criminal of a man was crying like a baby. Apparently nothing my friend had said had made a difference. Even the prayer itself made no difference. But I'll never forget what this man said. He said, that moment was the first time a man had ever reached out to him without taking a swing at him. It was the first time in his life that another man had touched him without trying to hurt him. And he became like a child again. God broke through by nothing more than a touch. How do you think the experiences of these two people I have described to you this morning, how do you think these experiences shaped their understanding of God? One got away with everything. One paid a price for everything. How do you think these experiences shaped their understanding of God? I'll never forget I'll never forget being in high school and reading something about God for the first time outside of church. You probably read it at some point. It was a famous sermon by this preacher in the 1800s named Jonathan Edwards. His sermon was Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It described God as dangling people over a fire, threatening them with hell at any moment. It was the first time I had ever been confronted with someone I felt like was misrepresenting God. Even as a teenager, I knew there was something dead wrong about that. It bothered me. It bothered me that we were having to read it in school, and it just bothered me because I knew it was wrong, but I didn't know how quite to put it into words. And of course now I know so much more, my journey has taken me so far, it's hard to look back and admit that I couldn't put it into words even as a 17 year old. But what I know now is that God has been misrepresented all throughout time. Think about what people have believed about God over the ages, that he was uncaring or distant, that he was angry, that he was responsible for all the bad things in life. If a tornado happened or an earthquake happened, that must be God taking something out on his children. And all of these false beliefs still affect us today. Even those of us who grew up being taught about the love of God, this 
in the back of our minds still affects us in some way. I, I think one theologian put it best. He said that Jesus was God's answer to a bad reputation. He said God sent his only son to set the record straight. And that is why we hold the words and life of Christ above all others. When we see everything that we believe about God through the words and life of Christ, we cannot be led astray by the beliefs of people who misrepresent God. The gift that Christianity gives to the world is not just a God who loves us. It is a God who loves us so much that he became one of us. Why? So that he could suffer alongside of us. Let that sink in. The same God who had been misrepresented all throughout time loves us so much that he was willing to come here and live like us and be crucified by the very people he was sent here to save. Now here's the problem. We, as human beings, have a very hard time believing that God does not react the way that we do. Then we project that belief back on God and lead other people to believe the same way. Let me give you an example. What is our human response to disobedience? Let's use a more painful example. What is the response of a wife or a husband to unfaithfulness? We want to lash out in anger. And we think that because we react that way, that God must react that way as well. And that is not what we find in the gospel. We cannot earn God's grace. We cannot beg for it enough. We cannot appease God enough. The gospel says that it is a gift given to us and we can either receive it or we can choose to reject it. But it is not God's decision. It is our decision to make. In this New Testament passage that we read this morning, the disciples are asking questions that bothered Jesus. And he responds with a warning about misrepresenting God. Jesus clearly took this issue very seriously. He begins to describe how they need to become like children again because they have lost their way. He tells them that if they were to lead children astray, that it would be better for them to have a millstone strapped to their necks and thrown into the sea. Some of our young people may not know what that was. A millstone was a huge stone that weighed hundreds of pounds. Why would Jesus use such strong language to the disciples and to us about this issue? Because as people of God, it is our responsibility to teach the loving nature of God and not project our shortcomings on our understanding of our Creator. We can make the mistake of adding to people's problems, leading people to believe that they are sinners in the hands of an angry God. When we know that we come and worship a God that would leave the other 99 behind just to come seek us out and be more delighted just to find that one than the other 99 who did not go astray, does that sound like sinners in the hands of an angry God? But deep down, we still think that it's God's decision, don't we? Don't we ultimately think that we're going to stand before our maker and that he is going to make the call whether or not we enter into the eternal light? Jesus is trying to tell us that this is a gift that cannot be earned. It cannot be begged for enough. The only thing you can do is receive it. And what people do instead is make their lives a living hell. And there is no fully understanding it. Evil is introduced into the Bible in ways we don't understand. It just appears. But it is clear that we have to deal with it. All of us know someone who has just continually invited evil into their lives, just made a mess of their own lives. Why? It is a great mystery, but it happens all the time. 
I want to read to you some song lyrics by a guy named Scott Stapp. Many of you know him as the lead singer of the band Creed. Some of you may know his story. This guy has lived a life on a roller coaster like no one I have ever seen. Fame, money, drug addiction, jail, suicide attempts, bouts of sobriety, weddings, divorces, just up and down and up and down. And here are some song lyrics he wrote before all of that happened in a song called My Own Prison. He says, court is in session, a verdict is in, no appeal on the docket today, just my own sin. My face showing no emotion, shackled by my senate, expecting no return, here there is no penance, my skin begins to burn. I hear a thunder in the distance, see a vision of the cross. I feel the pain that was given on that sad day of loss. A lion roars in the darkness, only he holds the key. A light to free me from my burden and grant life eternally. I cry out to God, seeking only his decision. Gabriel stands and confirms, I've created my own prison. I think he's tapped into something there that helps me to understand that all God wants to do is to surround us with his love in ways that we never thought were possible. And what we do, in effect, is to throw up obstacles that will keep that from happening. The answer lies in our most basic concept of humanity, which is our freedom to choose. We believe that God is love, we don't have any problem with that part, we teach it, we believe it, then we have to remind ourselves that love by its very definition does not coerce. God is not going to make you do anything. And so by its very definition, love will let you go if that is what you choose. I love the way one of my mentors put it. He said it this way. Love will not, would not, in fact, cannot overpower another against their will and still be love. I want you to hear that again. Love will not, would not, in fact, cannot overpower another against their will and still be love. We should not fear this God of love. We should fear our own decisions to insist on trying to live on our own terms because God will let us. Or we can learn and teach and project the gospel of the living Christ. In the beginning of my sermon, I told you about this friend of mine that seemed to get away with everything. A few years later, he had somebody steal a bunch of stuff from him. And I remember him standing there looking in his garage and saying, when am I going to stop getting paid back for all the things that I did? Of, after years of just throwing his life away in horrible alcoholism, he finally made it to a point where you know, he had to choose whether or not he was going to live or die. And he got himself cleaned up, got involved in a good church, and after just being open to it and wanting to learn, he finally realized in his words, I had been wrong about God all along. He said, I always thought it was about fire insurance. Finally, after a few years of being open to it, he learned about God's grace. And it changed everything for him. This is not new theology. God has been trying to tell us all along. Even the psalmist said, teach me, O Lord. Give me understanding. Let me, lead me in the path. Turn my heart, turn my eyes 
Let your steadfast love come to me, your salvation according to your promise. Dear God, let it be.